for somebody who, who is a, a landowner. It doesn't matter whether you have a house block or a thousand acres. Because as my good mentor said, when I asked him the question, what about the urban blocks? He said, we've got to understand every plant counts. So I'm Rob Skinner um, and I'm a resident of the Windsor Caribbee Shire. I've been here for the last 20 years or so. And um, for the last 15 years, I've been involved in landscape re regeneration. Um, I was mentored by uh, Peter Andrews as one of the pioneers in the landscape regeneration uh, field. I mean, I, I was a city boy. I, I, I came from, um, you know, I've been in construction most of my life, project manager in construction, had businesses and, and in and out of businesses. And what I did was I had a period where, where uh, I'd sold a business and had some time available and, and I spent a, a lot of time at the Steiner School in, in Barrow, uh, where my daughter went for the first uh, five years. and. Um, one of the tasks there was to uh, the, the, we wanted to do was build a biodynamic garden, and so I, I realised that uh, I knew little about it, and so I, 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 that was my first course in, in an agricultural pursuit. We've moved uh, back into our shire with the whole principles of landscape regeneration, and uh, now uh, I'm, I'm heavily involved with um, Regen Action in the Southern Highlands uh, or Windsor Caribbee Shire. Uh, and with the intention of uh, getting as many people to come on board for landscape regeneration as we possibly can. So this, uh, this property that we're on here is uh, a property owned by uh, uh, David Sargent. He runs a business, uh, Sargent Pastoral. And th this is a 400 acre property, uh, or a little bit bigger than 400, 420 acres. Uh, and uh, it's on the edge of the Windsor Caribbee Shire, Shire. So the back boundary here is on the boundary between Goulburn Mulwari and Windsor Caribbee. So it's a, the southern, extreme southern end of the Shire. Uh, it, it has been traditionally been a grazing property uh, and Dave's been here for the last 10 to 15 years. We isolated an area down the northern end of the property where we're going to uh, ultimately form that into a not-for-profit organisation where we have a, uh, an education, a learning, a training uh, facility and then using the property, the remaining area of the property, to uh, train people and show them how, uh, as a demonstration site, how everything works. So normally what would happen in this gully is the water would all flow down that gully, the, the concentration of water would go down through the gully, down the creek and, and away and off the property. What we've got now is by having these interventions, we've got the water that's collected in that gully, comes down here, and here we've got a little bit of a contour around the back of this little um, water catchment. And the idea of that is that takes the energy out of the water, because the one thing we want to do is take the, the, the velocity out of the water. And, and because it's that velocity that causes damage, causes erosion, causes a topsoil to disappear. You know, so, so that one of the key issues that we do to overcome that is what we call slow the flow. So what we do is we say every drop of rain should be stored as close to where it falls on any given property. And we know that we can store abundant amount of water under the, under the soil. That's how this landscape worked. It's way more efficient, it's way more effective uh, and, and um, for, a, for a myriad of reasons. The second one is plants. In, and and we, under, we need to understand that, that all plants uh, uh, have, a, have a significant p part to play. Even, even the pioneer plants like the thistles and the, uh, and, the, and the things that we don't like, they're all there for a reason. And nature um, has them for a reason. Now we've got to find a way to cooperate and collaborate with nature, not you know, come in and think we're gonna have a, a billiard table lawn and everything that we do and, and that sort of concept. So it's, it's working with the understanding of how the plants work. The plants are, give us great signals about what's happening in our environment. 
So when that soil's balanced, when it's when it's hydrated, when we've got you know a, a fertile environment, then every, every everything doesn't need you know we we don't have those pests and diseases. Then we've got everything that eats that produce in a in a in a situation where they're healthy because what they're eating is healthy and 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 the and the whole biome and the biological system and the nutrition and everything else all fits into place i think the biggest uh, greatest uh, challenge is is really about um <clears throat> changing uh, uh, i guess it, uh, assisting people or helping people to change a paradigm. Um, we, we have this paradigm about how agriculture should work and how farming and how, how landscape um, uh, care should work. And the evidence is clearly in, we've failed. Uh, so hanging on to all those past things because of our need to be right and all those things that cement us into that position is, is really what holds us back. Uh, it all stems from a thing that we, a, a group of us got involved with some 12 or 18 months ago when we realised that uh, landscape regeneration is, is, has the capacity to um, really make a dent in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and so we set a target that within the Windsor Caribbean Shire, if we could get 50% of the, the landowners to capture 1% of carbon in the, in the soil, we could, um, theoretically, we can um, capture all of the greenhouse gas emissions for our shire. If we don't do something now, uh, we, we're probably going to have a problem, a serious problem, and that'll be food security and water security and the likes. And so now we have a, certainly in the Western world, we have a, a, you know, a serious problem with, with the, the quality of food because it's all factory type food now and, and industrial type food. And so we know the nutrition's not there. We know that it's, a, it's the precursor for all of the, uh, uh, failed immune systems uh, and and that's as evidence is in humans as it is in the animals um, and, and we know for instance in nature that uh, with, with grazing animals that um, we've got all these problems and everything needs to be um, vaccinated and, uh, and and supported chemically because um, the, the natural process is failing us. So from the very essence of water to human life and existence in a healthy way is all interconnected. And if we don't join those dots and work together, we'll be at our peril. Because I can guarantee all of us that if we keep going like we are in another hundred years, and like many civilizations before us, which failed shortly after their agricultural land failed, we'll follow that same path again without learning that lesson. And we, and humans might well be extinct and, and nature will work out another way how to re-evolve it and, and it'll go back to the drawing board and come up with another solution. We just won't be here. <laughs> and that's not a solution I want for my grandkids. I recently had lunch at a, a winery, a local winery, and it's a very lovely meal and beautiful setting with trees and a most immaculate velvety green lawn. It was, it, it was just the most beautiful lawn I've seen and I was sort of initially I was a bit jealous. I thought, oh, I wish we had lawns like that at Redford Park. And then I thought, well, actually, no. Firstly, it was a monoculture. It was just one species of grass. There was no, no biodiversity there. And secondly, it was a very deep green. Obviously, it had been chemical, chemical fertiliser had been used on it. And then I thought, and they probably use herbicides here as well. And probably because of the chemical fertiliser, they probably use insecticides. And probably because it's all that sappy growth, they probably use fungicides. So then I thought, this lawn is actually an ugly lawn because really it's full of ugly things that really we don't want in our environment. And the water here, when it washes off, goes into, the, into our water supply. Um, and so why would we be putting all these chemicals and, and, and dangerous um, elements into, a, into something to make it beautiful when we can actually make a beautiful lawn like this without using those chemicals? Hello, my name's Rick Shepherd. I'm the head gardener at Redford Park, which is a National Trust property in Barrow. I've been working at 
Bretford Park for 10 years now, or just over 10 years. Initially it was with James Fairfax. When I first started we had 200 hectares of property. Most of that was cattle pasture with 10 hectares of garden which I was responsible for. I've still got the 10 hectares but about six years ago some of that land was sold off for housing development and now National Trust own it and we've got 34 hectares in total with 10 hectares of garden. So Retford Park is in the Southern Highlands of New South Wales and we are considered a cool climate area with about 650 metres above sea level. So we have a mild winter, a cold to mild winter and a mild to warm summer. So this brings in uh, a, a different plant palette that you might get in say in Sydney or, uh, or on the coast. We have frost in the winter. We also have um, very good volcanic soils and, a, and a quite a moderate rainfall, like about 1200 millimetres a year on average. So we, you know, we're, we're it's, it's a bit very benign sort of garden, like it's, it's, it's kind of an easy place to, to garden because we've got you know, good soils, we've got mild climate, a bit of frost and um, you know, good frequent rainfall. But we've also got a lot of heritage here and that brings constraints to the, what we can do here. We've got the existing beautiful um, homestead here and a lot of outbuildings, but also the heritage trees that are here and a heritage style, which was uh, basically, basically an English landscape style. Not a lot of natives used, unfortunately, from, from my point of view, but we still um, manage to you know, manage the garden in a very ecological friendly way, even though it's not natives. One of the first things I did when I came here was started a bird list. So we started recording the species of native birds and we've got, I think, maybe up to 87 now species we've recorded. But there has been some changes over the years. Some of those no longer come here, like the finches no longer frequent, probably because of all the development that's happened with the housing around here, clearing of the land. Uh, over 800 trees were cut down and just change in management from pasture to um, housing has, has really had an effect on the bird life here. One of the guys that works in the garden with me here is Jim and he's a great bird expert and every few months he'll come up all excited he's seen a, a new bird species which is always something that we, we celebrate. Yep. Recently we had a um, Rufus fantail here and then last year there was a scissor grinder and then we've had um, oh, a dollar bird I think it was. So there is, there is excitement you know, about birds um, coming into the garden that we haven't seen before and, and I think you know, all the practices that we've been doing here is providing habitat not using chemicals, um, planting natives. I think this is all, it's all starting to come slowly into fruition and we're, we're celebrating that. So they're a wood duck, yeah. It's been a really good year for them because the, um, it's been so much rain, the grass is growing crazy and they love, they actually eat grass. Yeah, they're happy as anything. Being a heritage site here, we are limited to the plant palette. Uh, so we've got mainly North American and, and Northern European species here, some um, from other countries as well, but unfortunately not many natives. So what we try and do is, is where we can, we do plant natives in amongst the heritage, you know, rhododendrons and um, hedges, etc., to try and improve the, the biodiversity here, try to attract birds to the garden. Birds are important in the garden because they're really good pollinators and they're really good at insect control and they're just an indication that it's a healthy ecosystem. So we do other um, methods as well to try and improve the biodiversity. We've got some bird nesting boxes, we've got watering stations for the birds. We've got habitat um, in, the, in the form of um, branches and, and sticks that we leave around to create more habitat for them. Even if we can't plant as many natives as we'd like, we try and pro provide the habitat in other ways. When we uh, planted the orchard just behind where we're sitting now, a few years ago, it was, its face is south, so it was quite um, wind exposed. So we did plant a, a bank of natives there as a windbreak and, and a shelter belt and also habitat for birds because it's really good to have birds near the orchard because they're part of your pest control system. Uh, they'll come in and control insects, etc. So quite a few natives there and we have had a lot, like lots of wrens and scrub wrens and, and um, and black faced cuckoo shrikes have been down there, so we, we know that it's, it's, it's working. The good thing about that windbreak is that we haven't had to water it. Um, obviously you're planting native plants which are native to the highlands, they're adapted to these conditions and that's something that people can take on at home. Uh, you're not only providing habitat for birds, but you're, you're reducing the amount of water you need to um, use on the garden and, and you know, being responsible. There's only a certain amount of water around and it's best to, to use it responsibly. So we've got white fly here, see these tiny little guys? And this little beetle is actually eating them. So this is great, uh, biological control in action. 
So when I first started here, there was a little bit of resistance to the sorts of um, ideas that I was bringing to the gardens. There was obviously existing personnel here, then they've been used to being managed in a different way, and they were going, "Oh, that's not going to work." You know, how's that going to work? And what I did is actually just took off-site all the chemicals that were here, and I think that did cause a bit of anxiety with some of the people here because they were going, "How are we going to manage?" But over time, people have um, came around and could see that the results spoke for themselves. But any time there's change, like people, um, people find change difficult, and so that was, um, it was it was tricky to start with to try and convince people that this was going to work. But I persevered, and it's as you can see today, it's um, it's a fantastic garden, and it's all done without chemicals and in a sustainable way. One part of the garden that does need to be watered a lot is the veggie patch. And I think it's worthwhile doing this because if you're growing your own veggies, I mean, you're getting a really good quality, um, delicious food that you can enjoy. And you know that, that it's not chemical free and it's, and it's healthy. But also you're, you're not um, having a truck ship it from North Queensland or from Western Australia. You know, so your carbon footprint when you're eating your own vegetables is very, very small. And so to use a bit more water on that, I think, is, is justified and that's something that we should be encouraging is growing your own food, even if it does mean you need to water it. I think as a society we've become quite uh, wasteful and too ready to you know, throw things out if they're broken rather than fix them. Um, and I think we're seeing that you know, the resources of our planet aren't endless and we need to live in a more sustainable way so that we can continue living on this planet and for, you know, hopefully hundreds and thousands of years to come. My name is Simon Kemp and I live here in Burradu with my wife and two boys and we bought this property almost three years ago now but before that we lived in the city so we didn't have much experience managing a larger piece of land. We'd spent quite a few weekends and holidays down in the Highlands um, and having both of us having come from Northern Europe I think the climate was something we were used to and we quite enjoyed the cooler evenings um, and the change of seasons. My name is Tristan Simpson. I'm from the bush care team um, run by Winter Calgary Council. Uh, mate. Thank you. So the Habitat for Wildlife um, program that Council runs is for smaller uh, land parcels. Um, to qualify for land for wildlife, it has to be at least half a hectare. So we heard about the Habitat for Wildlife program from a friend and we jumped on the council website and found out all about it and signed up from there. So after we signed up we got a package through in the post which included this guide for um, planting um, as well as this plaque which we can hang on the gate or on the fence to show that we're part of the program. The process of joining Land for Wildlife, um, you fill out your application form and send it over to Council and then we'll get in contact with you, set up a date to then come to the property and do a property assessment. During that property assessment we'll bring a bunch of maps with us. Um, they will outline biodiversity corridors, they will outline um, streams, they will outline the PCT types and the vegetation formation and one that we've recently added is also the koala habitat map. So, it all um, outlines the habitat that you have on your property and how suitable it is for koalas. So this is a biosecurity weed and so is this, so this is the blackberry and this is um, flax broom. Uh, so for this one here, you can simply at the base of the tree, just cut it with a pair of secateurs and dab a little bit of poison on it. Um, you can scrape the um, near towards the base yeah. and apply a little bit of herbicide if you don't want to spray. We'll compile a species list of natives that we find um, on the site and then also a list of weed species that we find and treatment methods and um, a priority list as well as to which ones to treat first. So for example blackberry was a very high one on the list whereas dandelion is very low on the list so we'll give them as much information to help guide them to make their property more environmentally friendly. 
One of the easiest ways to do that is to plant more Australian natives that are endemic to this area. They are more accustomed to living in this area, so they're going to last a lot longer, whereas some of these exotics may not survive during some of these more harsher drought periods. Uh, so this is called a heavy stack. Um, during a bushfire season, it could become a potential hazard for you know increasing bushfire, although there is a bit of a distance between it and the house, so not too bad, but during a bushfire season, you would tidy this up and clear it away. So you get a lot of lizards, um, lots of different types of insects, and even potentially snakes as well, which is good, it'll keep your rodent population down. The more snakes you have, less mice and rats that you're gonna have around the house as well. But it can add protection for small birds if they're being hunted by any sort of domesticated cats from our neighbors. Um, it can offer protection for all kinds of different animals. So I mean, I think even though we were quite central to Barrel, um, we had bushfires coming from sort of the north and the south, right? So, um, you know, emotionally, I think it was a Christmas period that neither of us really felt like we could relax during. Um, you know, one day the fires were coming close down into Mittagong and we had embers in the kind of almost landing in the back of the property. Um, and then the, the weather would change and, you know, the, the, the southerly would come in and actually start blowing that far away, but blowing the other fire closer, right? So um, it was quite, uh, you know, uh, something new for us to, to deal with that and to kind of be worried about, you know, what can we do um, to, you know, protect ourselves, protect our property, and, you know, just what was going to happen. Right? It was an uncertain time. The more people that we can get to sign up to the Habitat for Wildlife program, um, it joins up private areas of bushland that aren't that big but collectively they add up quite quite a lot and in the suburbs there's quite a lot of uh, wildlife around. There's tons of different um, bird species, possums, gliders, even koalas have been found in Bowral so there's plenty. Uh, so signing up for the Habitat for Wildlife and the uh, Land for Wildlife program uh, increases um, biodiversity uh, can save you money on uh, watering plants. Um, Australian neighbours are much more resilient, don't need as much water. And it also increases the climate resilience of your garden. I think people should get a bit on board with uh, sustainability because it's all of our responsibility. It's not just one person, it's not just a corporation or the government, but it takes everybody to be involved and everyone can make a difference with it. Uh, if somebody wants to become a member of the Habitat for Wildlife, they can find all the information on the council website.